My first guest in studio now is Taoiseach and leader of Fine Gael, Deputy Enda Kenny TD. Welcome, Taoiseach. Thank you, Billy. And welcome back to Waterford. Anytime. Uh, always a pleasure to be here on your show. Whingers. Do you expect to find many whingers in Waterford today? No, no. And do you regret describing some of your constituents uh, in those I, terms I yesterday? I wasn't to members of the public. Uh, this, this was a local, a local issue. I wasn't referring to members of the public anywhere, nor indeed my own county and my own town. I was referring specifically to a number of pro- full-time professional um, uh, politicians at the Fianna Fáil party who've constantly sp- talked down their own town who constantly scaremonger about... But why didn't you name them yesterday instead of, instead of turning around and saying that well, there are some people in this town who wouldn't know sunshine if they saw it? That's who I was referring to. And if any but why didn't you taken, name them? If any offence was taken by the public, Billy, then I, I regret that. Obviously, I'm speaking specifically about uh, Fianna Fáil politicians. OK, we'll move on. Let's put that to Thank bed. You. Thank you. <laughs> now, your party slogan in this campaign has been let's keep the recovery going. There are thousands of people around the country, including here in, here in Waterford, who are asking what recovery? And that's why we have to keep it going. The big signals here are, are, are very strong. Unemployment down, deficit down, debt falling, uh, interest, rates, uh, interest rates way down, uh, 135,000 jobs created. But of course, I recognise that there are so many people out there who still don't feel the benefit of that recovery. So what I'm talking about is creating 200,000 jobs, everybody paying less tax, but invest the proceeds of that into the employment of the teachers and the doctors and the nurses and the guards so that you bring the recovery home and not just home so that every person can actually say, now I can feel and see the benefit of a strong economy. Because you but the perception here in Waterford is that we have been left behind in all of those areas that you've just described. Because when you look at what's gone job, job-wise to the likes of Limerick mm-hmm. and to Cork, mm-hmm. we're not at the races here and we haven't been under your administration. Well, th- this is nothing new. When we had this, the so-called Celtic tiger prowling around the country when billions were sloshing around and indeed being wasted, the very same sentiment is, was expressed in so many places around the country that the Celtic tiger never visited our quarters. Now, when I had the privilege of taking up government, the cupboard was empty. You didn't have enough money to pay the teachers, the guards or the nurses. That's why you had to have specific pay agreements. And I fully understand uh, that people in Waterford or anywhere else can say, well, I haven't felt it, even though the figures in Waterford do show that across the region uh, there's been quite a drop in the numbers of people who have been unemployed off the live register. Uh, Let let me make a point here, uh, Billy. I was over, I I know Bosch and Lam are now now proceeding ahead to employ extra people and, and, and all of that. I met with them privately in New York when they made the decision to close down Bosch and Lam completely. And I would say that we came to an agreement with them that if they could reach an agreement with the workers that they'd continue to employ and reconstruct and rebuild. And fair play to the workers for doing that. So it's a case of, it's a case of having experience to negotiate, cut a deal and get on with it. So that's why we're down here again today in, um, in Waterford to launch the regional action plan in terms of jobs, uh, which includes, for instance, now... I know, but people are saying, with all due respect, we are still hurting. Okay. Of course, we're, you are, but you're we're only barely making ends meet. Can we trust this crowd again? Well, the, the, now you've put your finger on the on the on the, on the on the button here. The government over the last five years of Fine Gael and Labour have pulled the country politically back from an economic abyss. Here, they're the big figures. What I want to see, Billy is that we continue that progress so that you can build your just and your fair Ireland. You can be compassionate and kind and considerate for the older people who need that. You can create the Ireland for the young parents who have had serious childcare costs in the past by putting in the fruits of a strong economy into that. But do you not understand how hollow that that rings in the ears, for example, of a homeless person listening to us today? What have you done on that front? Given them free fabs? walk the streets of Dublin talking to the homeless. Of, you, you understand that the entire construction and building sector went over the edge. We had 3,000 ghost estates left around the country. We had 175,000 construction workers lost. We now have to retrain tilers and plasterers and roofers and, 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 and all of these. But you didn't give local authorities money to build public housing. Really, they have, we have uh, Paddy Coffee is the Minister for Housing, about three billion on the table for every local authority. And this morning, there are 900 houses being built on 63 sites by county councils around the country. So, uh, 
you, you the, the, the supply is the, is the key and you can't just put blocks and concrete in the ground like that that's why you brought in emergency modular housing in Dublin that's why you reduced the levies in Cork and Dublin that's why you changed the building regulations of the standards so that people could get back into building more quickly but let me make another point one of the first things that, that happened when I became Taoiseach was that Talk Talk went here in Waterford and out of that came came Ishtek and out of the ashes of Talk Talk and consequent on that decision was the first thing the government did was to say we want a technological university for the southeast for the young people here for the future so that they could have hope and not just hope but qualifications to get them jobs in this region now we've introduced the technological universities bill but there were complications between Waterford and Carlow that you're well aware but who created those complications well they certainly weren't created by government because the the two institutions were if there. you've given if you had given and given the legislation to, to allow the WIT stand alone no, you're well you wouldn't aware, have the problem you're well aware of the history of the difficulties here. My focus was on saying to young people in the southeast, there is no university, there is no technological university. We want to set that up for you, but with standards that apply to the highest level nationally and internationally. We actually introduced the bill in the doll. It'll be for the next government to come back and see what the complications are with that from the institutional point of view. But my view was make a government decision, because government is about making decisions, and put that in place for the young people of the southeast. Okay, can we move on, because there's so many things I have to cover this morning with you in a very short space of time. Let's look at the Hawks Hospital. There is a perception here in Waterford with the realignment that we were sold a pup. Okay. Now, can I quote you a question that was put by none other than Dr. Brendan McCann, the consultant in emergency medicine at UHW at a recent uh, pre-election debate that we had on this programme? And he put it to Paddy Coffey, who answered it, but I want to put it to you now. Trolley figures at UHW, he said, in 2015 stood at 2,445. In 2008, the figure was 496. This represents a 392% increase under the current administration. Despite this, UHW got zero funding as part of the recent winter handout money, quote unquote. Despite this, he goes on to say the austerity measures implemented by Fianna Fáil and maintained by Fine Gael and Labour, in particular bed closures at UHW, about 90, and at St. Patrick's Hospital are still in place. And he asks, can you explain this? Yeah, he makes my point that you cannot deal with Waterford Regional or any other hospital or any other sector unless you've got a strong economy. We have put out the plan and the No, programme. you're firing money at the health service, but it isn't working. No. We're, we've put out the plan of the programme so that, so, that you, so that you're going to have the resources to invest properly and effectively with proper management in the hospitals uh, for, for, for delivery of, of uh, patient services. And that's why you're, you're building it on a number of platforms. One is community where you have more home care packages, more home help hours so that people can, have their, can, can stay in their own homes for as long as possible. The development of the primary care centre is 46 built, another 80 to come. Fianna Fáil took 1,245 beds out of the health system. We've put back 300. In the last two years, because the economy is beginning to recover, you've been able to put in 900 million extra into the health budget, which allows for the minister to say, my plan for reducing trolley weights is to invest in this in such a way that the numbers are falling. And his plan is working, despite the fact that there was a 10% increase in attendances because of the flu. So he's got a strategy and a plan and got more money from government because the economy is recovering to invest in this. The same applies in all with the same place in all the other hospitals. But say that to somebody who has an elderly relation, say of 93 or 94 years of age, lying on a trolley at the UHW for three days. I find it completely unacceptable that a 90-year-old or anybody of senior years should be having to stay there, stay in a trolley, no more than sit in a chair overnight. But in order to deal with that, that's why the minister brought in the escalation um, business, that if it gets too crowded in A&Es, that you can move beds into wards, and that has resulted in cancellation of operations. So in, in order to get this right, you do need investment, but you also need reform. And that's why the government have brought about the uh, the hospital groups so that the consultants are contracted to the hospital group and they will be paid for what they do instead of what they say they do and you put in far more effective control about the spend of public money so that the patients get the very best of quality. But then you have to take on the vested interest then. 
You have to take on the vested interest within the system. Which the, in politics, throwing more money at it is not going to solve it. I, absolutely. And in the last government, when they had 15 billion thrown out of the outturns, were worse. So now, so now you've got a situation where 1,245 beds were taken out. It's beginning to recover. The money that's going into health now is being invested very, very directly for the best of services. And fair play to the frontline staff who deliver that. 24-7 cardiac services we don't have we're committed to that but i think you have to you have to provide it securely and safely obviously during the during the uh, during the recession years and and as a consequence of them we've still managed to keep it open and the for the hours that it is open we were committed to 24 7 and i i, I note as well the letters that have been going around about the three professors two senior lecturers the clinical tutor and the administration finally delivered support. upon this morning yes of course but but like you, you can't have everything overnight you plow a field you sow your you sow your crop you roll it you've got to wait until until it takes its course to grow. But if you the know, head of University College Billy, Cork hadn't Billy, put, you, put the gun to your head, Billy, would you have delivered? I'm a new radio station here and privileged to be so. We intend to abolish the broadcasting levy on you people. This country was in the intensive care unit and you can't walk out of Waterford Regional uh, and play for, play for Waterford in the Championship the following week. You've got to grow in strength again. It's the same with our economy. For every sector, you can't have the guards, you can't have the teachers, you won't be able to have the nurses, but you can have them if you, if you manage your economy of Effectively, but can you have them, Tisha, with all due respect, if you're going to take €4 billion Euro out of the tax net? Well, what Abolish the USC? Yes, over, over the next five Where years. are you going to find the money from? We're up, well, we're up to our well, neck in debt as it stands. When we took up office, we said we'd create 100,000 jobs. They all said, first of all, you're in, in, in a bailout situation. You'll default. You'll never meet your payments. You'll never create 100,000 jobs. That's been beaten now by the private sector at 135,000. Our plan for the next five years is to create 200,000 jobs, to abolish the USC. This is about justice for workers, for hard-pressed income tax payers, for hard-pressed middle-income people. So we abolish it completely from 70,000 down. From 70,000 to 100, there's a, there's a tapering effect, and above 100, there's a 5% clawback. But that means, Billy, that you then have more money coming into the system, because when you reduce taxes, you get more in. Therefore, you create more jobs, and more jobs for the southeast, more jobs for Waterford, for Dungarvan, and everywhere else. And that flows into the economy, and that's why you can employ your teachers and your guards and your nurses and so on. Okay, we are in an open economy here in this country. You're saying bringing the recovery home. The signals from outside of our shores are not great. China, last month, the USA didn't do terribly good. And now, now you have Brexit uh, you know, Believe facing you us. Put your, you, uh, you, you know your stuff. You put your finger on, on a very important button here. There are storm clouds out there. And that's why you need a really strong, experienced team to negotiate this, both with Europe, with Britain and beyond. That's why... But how t- can you, in an election, promise us the sun, the moon and the stars? Yeah, and you're facing this, probably. As I can point to the record, we were faced with a situation when I went into government of having to pay £3 billion every year of your money for interest for Anglo-Irish Bank until 2023, left behind by Michal Martin and his colleagues. We were further required to pay 630 million extra in income tax increases left behind by Michal Martin and his colleagues. And we had a situation where they'd actually cut the lowest paid in the minimum wage and left that behind them as well. Plus introducing the... But your government d- didn't really stand up to Europe either in terms of a write down. We saved, were pussycats. We've saved the people here by virtue of interest rate reductions, by extension of maturities and the permits note, about four billion in interest every year, which is a very significant amount. But the point I'm making, you make a valid point here. Look at what's happening now with Brexit. I spent two days in Brussels last week talking to 27 other leaders and we gave Prime Minister Cameron his opportunity to have his referendum. Now look where the debate is going. People are now saying, well, we don't want to leave. We want a better deal. Do we understand what happens here? This could go on for six to ten years. I'm in firms all over the country where Irish workers are exporting to Britain and they're very concerned about what could happen here. And that's, Billy, why you need an experienced team to be able to negotiate this. Yes, China is moving from manufacturing to services. Yes, the oil glut is cyclical. Yes, the Syrian war and the unprecedented scale of migration. That's why this should not be left to novices. And we had a government in for 14 years that wrecked our economy and want to come back now and say we're holy Joes all as well. Okay, I have three more questions for you. Let's bring it right home to the Waterford constituency. Do you think that F- Fine Gael will win two seats this time round? I do. We have a very strong team here. And are you equally supportive of both candidates? 
I, of course, I'm, I'm supportive. I've got no two candidates. Party Coffee and John Deasy, they're their own men. They stand for Fine Gael. They stand for what we believe in. They stand for the South East. They stand for Waterford. They stand for keeping this recovery going so that their young people can have jobs in this region, so that we can grow across the... Sectors. And do you stand behind them both equally? Absolutely, 100%. I've just met John D.C. downstairs. He's his own man. Minister Coffey's his own man. Let me make one final point about the South East here. Between 2000 and 2007, 66 jobs out of every 100 created were either in construction or in public service. One job was for exports. We have changed that entirely, where it's now 45 jobs out of every 100 are export-led. And that's where the future is, Billy. It's not in messing around with an economy now or creating uncertainty. We've started a process here. We've moved along the direction, in the right direction. We need to keep that going. It's the people's choice on Friday. No matter what you think of the polls, and I know you're going to give me the classic answer, the only poll that matters, of course, is the election no, day itself. The okay, okay. Tell you something else. Okay. There are 18% as of the Irish Times uh, poll uh, this morning undecided. So in some sense, it's still all to play for. But what are you playing for? Surely it's up to you and the, and the electorate deserves yeah. some answer as to who you will get into bed with post-election. You're playing for the future. That's what you're playing for. You're playing for the future of Ireland, the South East. No, no, that's not specific enough. Sorry, who are you going I, to get well, into bed with post-election? Let me finish. The, the point you make is the valid point. No votes have been cast in this election yet. One person has been elected, the former can uh, Sean Barrett. Now, 18%, they're the people who are going to make the decision here. You have others committed to the different parties and different groupings. It's that 18% who are going to decide the direction of Ireland for the next five years. So I am saying to them, here's our proposition. Look at the record of the last five. The recovery has not come into your home. But that wasn't my question. Who will you get into bed with post-election? Because you won't make up the numbers with Labour. Forget that. Before the election, you never know in the last eight minutes of a match what can happen. How many games are won and lost in the last eight minutes? My proposition is you've got a, a government of stability, of a proven record, Record, is moved along the track in the right direction. Still a long way to go. 41% of those polled in Dublin, just hold on a minute, 41% of those polled in Dublin said that they were go- going to give the number one to an independent. Mm. I would ask them if the they're present coalition can't win I, Dublin. I would ask them, uh, Billy, if they're committed to an independent with the greatest of respect to pass on their votes to uh, a government representative afterwards. Because go- this is about government. It's not about a collection of independents with respect to them. And there are some very good people. But isn't it time yourself and Fianna Fáil got over yourselves and you know, got into, I mean, for God's sake, I- I- ideologically, economic policies, very little between Fianna Fáil you. Fianna party. Have no style might be a bit have different. Have no plan in place. Last October, they voted against the USC reductions, which Waterford people are now getting. They 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 had their plan for water charges for 400 flat rate, no remission. They voted against every policy position that the government have taken. That is now. But it's not the nature of opposition. It's, well, it may well be the nature of politics, but if they were going to be constructive in the national interest, as I said, they would. Here we are. And remember, that's the party that was 14 years in charge of our country, of your kids' finances and their futures, and wrecked 300,000 jobs and a quarter of a million gone away. And you expect me to say... But looking at Michael Martin's performance in the polls, there would seem to be an air of forgiveness around the place at the moment. There may well be. And populism is great. Opposition politics are one thing. Responsibility of government is another. To, to make the decisions that were very difficult on so many hundreds of thousands of people, believe me, as a public representative for 40 years, Billy, is not an easy thing to do. But we can see the benefits now beginning to flow. And I want that to happen so that we can look after the young, give those in the middle the chance... Uh, you can't do that unless you're in power so who would you get into bed with can't do it unless you've got a strong economy and we have a government that has proven that that works and I have every faith and confidence in the people on Friday that they will vote in that line and if they've given uh, committed to independent members that's that's their choice of course and I would respectfully ask that they would pass on their preferences to government representatives after that Tishak and Kenny thank you very much thank you Billy good morning to you 